Um, yes, sir. Okay, we are ready to continue with uh, amplitudes. Okay, thank you. So, uh, this is the second lecture. Okay, uh, so let me first uh, review a few things from the first lecture. And uh, the first thing uh, was uh, rewritten of the for momentum uh, in terms of a matrix representation. And actually, the matrix was correct. Yeah, the only thing is that uh, uh, it was slightly different uh, notation. Usually, the minus sign is on the first one. I put it on the last one. So uh, the determinant of this matrix is P square. For the massive particles, this is an SL2C matrix. But here, we say that P square is 0. Uh, so we are going outside it. And therefore, the rank of this matrix is 1, not 2. And uh, we can write this matrix uh, using two vectors. And in the end, we just rewrite the four momentum, say the other way around. Uh, instead of four momentum, we use these two spinners, lambda and lambda tilde, with some uh, transformation, set of transformation matrices. Now, the Lorentz transformation acts as uh, rescaling of this lambda lambda tilde. So if we act with the little group, we are in the sector of massless particles. Yes. Yeah. So, so I didn't say complex. No, no, no. This oh. is for complex momenta. I, I, let, let me go to that point in the end. Yeah. So. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. My, my question was if, if, it's, if lambda and its complex conjugate, w they wouldn't be conjugates anymore if you scale them. Yes, good. So, so here, in general, we, uh, uh, we work with complex momentum. So lambda and lambda tilde are not conjugate. They are independent. Yeah? So we can rescale them however we want, like that. They are independent. The product uh, is invariant under the rescaling. Now, uh, if we want real momentum, not just complex, but real, the lambda and lambda tilde are conjugate, and then t can be a phase only. Yeah, so e to the i phi and e to the minus i phi. Yeah? So this is a general description of the complex momentum, because we will mostly work with complex momenta. But of course, in the real world, we want real momenta in the end. Yeah? But in the all intermediate steps, uh, we work with complex momenta here. Uh, for example, these three-point amplitudes we discussed wouldn't exist for real momenta. We have to go to this larger space of complex momenta. But despite, in the end, we are interested in real momenta, having complex mom momenta in intermediate steps is extremely useful. Uh, OK, so using these lambda lambda tilde, uh, we can build these invariants. Uh, these are little uh, uh, one to angle bracket and one to square bracket as two by two determinants of these lambda 
and plumb that little down. Uh, spinners. So uh, then the S12, uh, the standard uh, momentum invariant is written as this product. Okay, then we discuss three point uh, amplitude. So there are these on shell conditions on the massless three point amplitude, and uh, there is momentum conservation and on shell conditions. And if we want to solve these conditions, uh, these are very constraining <laughs> equations we find two solutions. Either all the lambdas are proportional, and then all these brackets with lambdas are zero, or the other way around. Uh, so now we take, can take the solution, which doesn't exist for the real momenta, because if lambda and lambda tilde are conjugate, th these are guys, then both of the conditions must be satisfied, and means that all the brackets are zero, and in the end we actually get that all the momenta are zero. So, uh, but if they are independent, if the momenta are complex, these two solutions exist. And uh, then, uh, just using, uh, just using uh, this little group transformation, uh, we can fix any three-point amplitude, the kinematical part of any three-point amplitude, completely, uh, just uh, by the Lorentz symmetry. And uh, the for the, well, we can have particles with different spins and so on, but if you restrict, for example, to the single spin S particle, then uh, I showed that uh, for this helicity, where first two particles have plus and the last one is minus, we actually are, epic, uh, we are using that solution, and then this is the form for S equals one. This was gluons, S equals two gravitons, but there is no restriction on spin, just from three point. If we have the other helicity, uh, configuration, we would get this formula. And this is just by requiring uh, that uh, the, uh, the amplitude transforms correctly under this uh, little group transformation. And that's all. But we can do it for any, uh, for any helicity. So the three-point amplitudes are completely fixed. There is no function of like ST or U or anything like, like that doesn't exist for three-point. All the momentum invariants are zero. So these functions are fixed to all loop orders in perturbation theory. The only thing we can multiply is some by some constant. That's the only thing, yeah? Uh, but this is for free point. Uh, then uh, if we go to higher point amplitudes, uh, we wanted to think about amplitudes not as a sum of Feynman diagrams, but as a single function. And just use the basic properties of uh, this function uh, to completely fix it. So I haven't shown how to fix it. That will be half of the, half of the lecture today. Uh, but uh, the conditions we would like to use is the locality and unitarity constraints. And uh, in terms of kinematics, they mean following. So if this blob is the, let's say, tree-level amplitude in, uh, in this case, then the only poles of this function, which is some function of lambda, lambda, tilde, or also in terms of moment and polarizations, if you want, doesn't matter. Then the only poles are at p square, so there is one over p square are the only poles where p is the sum of external momenta. Uh, these are the only the only poles that show up in Feynman diagrams. You can prove it also based on the fact that particles interact point-like in momentum space. If you translate it to uh, in position space, if you translate it to momentum space. Uh, the point-like interaction will show up as a pole in p square equals zero. Uh, now the unitarity tells us that if I take this function and sit on this pole, p square is zero. Yeah, so I go near that pole, so the function blows up because it has a pole. But near that pole, it behaves like that, one over p square, which blows up. And then it's a product of function on the left and function on the right. Now the function on the left and right are actually an amplitude because uh, going to p square is zero means that this internal line, which in Feynman diagrams was originally off shell, is now on shell. Yeah? So we created internal on shell particle. So this is an on shell amplitude gauge invariant on one side and on shell gauge invariant amplitude on the other side. And uh, this is what the original amplitude gives us, the product of these smaller amplitudes for the fewer number of legs. Like here we start with some higher point amplitudes and it factorizes to lower point amplitudes. Now, uh, this is an interesting constraint or property. Now, uh, the question is, 
if we now list all the poles and write all these equations, is it enough to fix completely this original function? Because we are not saying what the function m is, we are just saying that on the pole it behaves like something. Uh, now, uh, we say that uh, the amplitude is on-shell constructible because it's using only these on-shell conditions if this is indeed enough. So if we satisfy all these properties, it uniquely fixes what the function is in the first place. Uh, okay, then we also discussed the consistency of four-point amplitudes, which was uh, the application of this formula. So unlike three-point amplitudes, which exist for all spins, if you try to construct the four-point amplitude for any spin, you would fail to satisfy these conditions. So you can always satisfy it on one factorization channel, like S channel, but if you want the same function to satisfy that condition on the T channel, it would fail, unless in some very specific cases, and uh, if we have a single, uh, if we have a, just the theory of uh, spin S particle, it was for spin zero and two, for single particle and for spin one, we needed actually a multiplet, like in Young Mills theory, the multiplet of gluons. And, uh, well, okay, of course, we can also mix different spins and then we can also generate various other constraints for them. But, for example, the nice application is that the higher spin uh, amplitudes are directly uh, killed just by this four point consistency condition. Okay, so now uh, let's proceed. So I said uh, that uh, these conditions are enough to specify the amplitude completely, but it would be nice to actually construct the amplitude rather than just prove that it's completely specified by that. And this is done using recursion relations. You can also see that from these factorization pictures there is something recursive because the higher point amplitude, the constraint on higher point amplitude like six point is uh, given by the products of lower point amplitudes. So there will be something recursive in this structure. Okay, so now let's uh, look uh, at the structure of the tree level amplitudes. Uh, so this will be everything about trees, no loops. The tree level amplitude is a rational function of kinematics. We can think about it as a sum of Feynman diagrams if we want, but uh, once we take the full amplitude, we can write it as uh, some uh, huge rational function, we just sum everything, uh, which has some numerator, depends on moment and polarization vectors, and it has poles in the denominator. So we, we just uh, take everything under common denominator, so it has many poles here in the denominator and some gigantic numerator, but it's a rational function. Now, uh, the poles in the denominator, as we said, are of the form P square, where P is the sum of external momenta. So this comes from Feynman propagators, if you want. There are only poles, no branch cuts, or nothing funny. Uh, and the amplitude is a spinner, uh, is a gauge invariant object, so we can use spinner helicity variables to write this function in terms of. The individual Feynman diagrams would have this dependence of these auxiliary spinners, but that's all gone in the amplitude. We can forget them, everything canceled. And now we want to reconstruct it. Uh, so the amplitude is on-shell constructible if only this relation, the, the set of these relations is enough to fix it completely. So we would like to somehow integrate this relation. Because here we know that if we go to a special kinematics, p square is zero, it factorizes, but we want the amplitude for arbitrary kinematics, not a special kinematics. So, uh, so it would be nice to write a relation which manifestly satisfies all these conditions. Naively, the first guess, you might think, is just to sum over all factorization channels, and on the right hand side, just put directly that relation. Yeah? So, of course, if we go with p goes to zero, there is a pole one over p squared, and there are directly these amplitudes here. So, that looks like it might work. Well, it doesn't work for many reasons, because here, uh, uh, P is not on shell, so these cannot be even on shell amplitudes. But even if you try to do, if you try to pretend that it's fine and do something like that, it doesn't work because this pole P square for a given channel, uh, these M left and M right have many other poles and they overlap with other term with uh, 
if you look at the p square in one term at that at that channel, then in other term the p square would be hidden inside m left on m right. So there are many overlapping channels. So this is wrong. Yeah, it's wrong for many reasons. Uh, but what we can do, because we would like something which satisfies these relations, and uh, the solution is that uh, we have to do some, we have to shift external kinematics and approach these factorization channels in a different way. So let's now look at it. So uh, let's choose two momenta, let's say P1 and P2. Uh, they are represented by lambda and lambda tilde, lambda one, lambda two, lambda tilde one, and lambda tilde two. And let's shift them uh, like that. So there is some parameter z, so lambda one is shifted as lambda one minus z lambda two. Uh, lambda two is unshifted, and lambda one tilde is also unshifted, and lambda two tilde is shifted like that. Yeah, so I just shifted external momenta. Uh, the nice thing about this shift is that it satisfies momentum conservation. So uh, if you take these new shifted, so this is a shifted lambda one and shifted lambda two tilde, and uh, I just write back momenta in terms of them. So this is a shifted lambda one tilde, uh, lambda one times lambda one tilde, because it's not shifted, plus lambda two times shifted lambda two tilde. Uh, this shift part just cancels between these two terms, and I reconstruct just P1 plus P2. Yeah, so it satisfies momentum conservation. I kind of edit a little bit to first uh, particle and uh, or edit here and subtract it here. So I just shifted things around. Well, the important thing is that even uh, after this shift, uh, the momenta are still on shell uh, because. Uh, this is just a new lambda one, and this is new lambda two tilde. It's shifted, but uh, the shifted, if you, if, if you then look at corresponded shifted momenta, P1 and P2, they are still on shell. Okay, so why, why this is interesting. Uh, now, the original amplitude, so there was some endpoint amplitude AN, uh, in terms of the original, momenta P1, P2 up to Pn, and now I shifted two of them. Specifically, I shifted their lambda and lambda tilde of these two particles. So this becomes some function of Az. Yeah? So now it's a function of Az, uh, uh, of, uh, of the parameter Z. And I can just look how it looks like. So there is some Z dependence in numerator, and then there is some Z dependence in denominator, but it's, uh, this structure is very similar to when there was no shift. So for z equals zero, I just reconstructed the original expression. Now, uh, what is the localization, or what are these poles, pj, z square? Now, we originally have the poles pj square, where pj was a sum of external momenta. So uh, now it depends on the pj, z. So if particle one, if the momentum P1 was inside Pj, this becomes shifted, and there is some extra piece added to that. If uh, particle uh, momentum 2 was inside, it becomes shifted like that. But uh, if none of them was there, it's unshifted. Yeah. If uh, none of the P1, P2 was inside this Pj, which is a sum of momenta, then uh, there, is no, there is no shift. So, because we are now specifically looking at the z dependence, what depends on z, only these two cases depends on z in a very simple way, in a linear way. That one doesn't. Now, what is the uh, location of the pole in z? Yeah? So we are now not looking at the pole as a function of momenta, but we are looking at the pole as a function of z. Uh, now, pj z square is just this thing square. So if we just square it, uh, then uh, we can rewrite it like that. So this, uh, if we square this function, we get pj square from here, and then this thing square from here, but this is just zero because we are contracting lambda two with lambda two and lambda one tilde with lambda one tilde. So the only term which is left uh, then is the scalar product of these two things. 
which, which is denoted by this mixed bracket I introduced earlier. But it's linear in Z. That's important. The quadratic piece is manifestly zero in Z. So if I want to set this to zero, then it happens for this particular value of Z, with, with which I denote as Zj. Yeah? So if I look at this shifted amplitude as a function of Z, the location of poles in Z are located at these values uh, where all the momenta here are considered to be fixed. Yeah, I'm not moving with momenta, I'm moving with Z. So if I want to approach this pole, I, a given pole, I move Z to this value, Zj, which is equal to that, and I approach the pole. Yeah? So, good. Now, uh, all the poles here are linear in Z. Yeah, this pole is linear in Z. So as a function of z, I can think about it as this thing. So there is some numerator which depends on z. And there is a product of linear poles in the denominator. Yeah, the zk is, depends on kinematics. That's the expression I showed before. And now let's consider following contour integral, dz over z, a and z. Now, this is a contour integral. And if uh, uh, the there is no pole at z goes to infinity, this integral integrating over all complex z's is zero. Yeah, this is a Cauchy's formula. This integral is zero. Uh, note that the original amplitude corresponds to the, the, the point where z is zero. So the residue at z equals zero gives the original amplitude. Uh, now, the residue theorem tells us that the pole at z equals zero of this expression plus the sum of all residues at all other poles is equal to zero. Yeah? This is a, this is a complex, uh, Cauchy's formula from the complex analysis. We have, a, we, have a, uh, we have a function if we sum over all the poles, suppose, uh, suppose that the function vanishes at z goes to infinity, the sum of all residues is zero. Okay, very good. So the thing that we want to calculate, a n, is related to some residues of this function. Okay, well, it doesn't seem very useful yet because how to calculate this thing. But uh, we will see very quickly that uh, this is actually what we can easily calculate. Okay, so a n is equal to minus sum of residues at z equals z k. Uh, these are all the poles in the uh, in a and z are located here. Now, so what is the residue on the pole? Well, the only poles came from, uh, from these propagators, p, j, z square, from these shifted propagators. Now, uh, the shifted amplitude is still an on-shell tree-level amplitude. So it satisfies unitarity relation, the same one we had before. It also should factorize. Now, it's shifted, but it doesn't matter. It's just on-shell amplitude with some momenta, uh, despite they depend on z. So if we start with a and z and go to the pole, pj z squared is equal to 0, which is a pole of this function, it just factorizes into left and right amplitude with 1 over pj z squared there. Yeah? It's exactly the same expression as before, but now for the shifted amplitude. OK. Uh, now, pjz square is equal to zero was, if we rewrote it, was given by this expression. So the zj, the position of the pole of this function, is given by this formula. This is pj square. It's the sum of the momenta in pj square divided by this mixed bracket. So near that pole, z equals zj, this thing behaves like that. So there is a left amplitude evaluated at zj, shifted and evaluated at zj, right amplitude shifted and evaluated at zj, and there is some remaining thing which comes from this 1 over p square, which was there before. So this is a residue of this thing on that pole. And this was exactly which was needed here. So uh, well, there is a little bit of. Uh, uh, 
we have to take, so this was the piece we just calculated. There is also this one over z. So we have to plug there z equals zk. Oh, well, we, don't, we, we denoted that zj before. That was equal to that. So this expression, the one term in the sum is equal to that. And this is exactly our final formula. So the endpoint amplitude is equal to the sum of over all factorization channels, pj, uh, and there is a left amplitude and the right amplitude. Both of them are shifted and evaluated at this point, zj. And the point zj was such that the, this shifted amplitude had a pole there. Yeah? So, uh, so using two different ingredients, uh, which was Cauchy's formula and the three-level unitarity, we are able to write endpoint amplitude as a sum of products of lower point amplitudes. So this is exactly this integration of uh, this factorization formula I had in mind. I needed a little bit more. You had to do some complex shift and so on, but this is, uh, this is just the technical implementation of saying that the amplitude is uh, on-shell constructible. It's completely fixed by these factorizations. Yes, any questions? Well, so, so, so there are two things. So this amplitude constructed like that would factorize properly. Yes. 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 Now the original amplitude factorizes properly. That was the input, the factorizations. Now you can ask, uh, are there two different functions which have the same factorizations? Yeah. So, uh, so, we, so there are like kind of two answers to that question. So first we assumed that the amplitude is fully fixed by factorizations. Yeah? So if it is fully fixed, then these must be the same functions. Well, this also appears in that argument, and I can point where it appears. So suppose that the amplitude is not fully fixed by the factorization, where it fails. Well, it would fail at this assumption. If the amplitude is not fully fixed by factorization, then the shifted amplitude would actually have a pole at infinity in this formula. Yeah, so if, you, if it is not fully fixed, you start with a n that you don't know, you shift it, you go for z, equals in, z goes to infinity, and there would be a pole. Uh, and that, that, that would indicate that just the factorization is not enough. Uh, but if this condition is satisfied, which is also the, uh, the requirement of using the Cauchy's formula here, uh, then the amplitude is constructed uniquely, and that's the unique amplitude. There is no other one. Yeah, anything that has the correct factorizations would be that answer. Yeah. But uh, if, you, if you have a theory or you have an amplitude which is not fixed by factorizations, for example, you can add a constant to it. Yeah. So let's just look at this argument. If there is a constant here, which doesn't have any poles, there would be a pole at z goes to infinity here. Yeah. The dz over z, uh, the, uh, this, uh, this thing would actually not vanish at infinity, and this formula will have a pole. Yeah, so that would fail. But uh, if it doesn't have a pole at infinity, then uh, you cannot add anything without poles. Uh, so the thing that you would like to add to, our, you know, to the correct result would necessarily have a pole. And if it has a pole, it would necessarily violate some factorizations because you already fixed all of them, uh, or, the, or the right answer already has all of them correct. Yeah, is that answer? Yeah. OK. So, so this is the formula. So uh, just maybe it's a little bit hard to see what it really means. But just uh, if uh, diagrammatically, we would have some blob. This is our amplitude, a n. It has some legs, 1, 2, that can be chosen arbitrary. There is nothing special about 1, 2. I just chose 1, 2. And uh, what is the in interpretation of this term? Well, this is a left amplitude, and this is a right amplitude after we factorize it, with leg one being shifted and leg two being shifted. 
the original shift, shift uh, had this three parameter z, but now I evaluate z at z equals z, z j, yeah, at this value. So there is no free parameter. Everything is fixed in each individual term. And uh, this z, uh, this uh, z j parameter is chosen such that this internal leg is on shell. If this internal leg is on shell, these are two on shell amplitudes. They are gauge invariant, and I can work with them. Yeah? In Feynman diagrams, this leg would be off shell, but uh, uh, here it's on shell. And now I have to sum. So what is this sum over? Well, I have to sum over all distribution of legs, which keep one and two on uh, different sides. If one and two are on the same side, then, as we said, the pj would not depend on z, and it even will not show up as a pole in the Cauchy's formula. So one and two must be each on one side, but then the sum is over all distribution of these other lengths. Yeah? So I'm summing over all factorization channels that keep one and two on different sides. So it's a subset of all factorization channels, because there are also the ones that when they are on the same side. You can see that it's recursive, because uh, in order to calculate this amplitude, you need to know all lower point amplitudes, uh, because left and right, this is an input. But once you know all lower point amplitudes, you can reconstruct the higher point amplitude. So therefore, these are recursion relations. Now, uh, this uh, crucial property was to be able to use it was that uh, A and Z are uh, a and Z has, uh, has to go to zero when Z goes to infinity. Otherwise, exactly, we would violate that condition. The A and Z wouldn't be fixed only by factorizations, and the Cauchy's formula wouldn't work. Uh, for example, in Young's theory or massless QCD, uh, this is satisfied. So this is a non-trivial constraint on the theory that uh, you can uh, reconstruct the amplitudes. This is satisfied, but you have to do this. You have to be a little bit careful when you do these shifts of uh, lambda one and lambda two tilde. Uh, the helicity of the particle one must be plus, and the helicity of the particle two must be minus. If you do it a different way, this wouldn't be satisfied. But if you do it right, that would be satisfied. And the same thing is for uh, Einstein gravity and many other theories. It's not true for the all amplitudes in the standard model. I will comment on it a little bit later. OK. Now, uh, OK, well, let's comment on it now. So in the standard model and other theories, basically all renormalizable theories, including some of the non-renormalizable as well, uh, we can still reconstruct the amplitudes from factorizations. But this uh, simplest procedure wouldn't work. We have to shift more momenta than just two. Yeah, but there is an extension of this. Two momenta is the smallest number. It works for some cases. If we want all interesting theories, let's say, we need to shift more momenta. Uh, now, suppose that we have masses. So everything here was for massy, massless particles. Uh, we use spinner helicity variables. But uh, adding masses is actually not a problem. We cannot use the spinner helicity variables anymore. But we can do these recursion relations directly in the momentum space. Uh, it's a little bit uh, less, uh, less convenient, but we can do it. Uh, the idea is simple. We shift P1 now to P1 plus ZQ, where Q is some complex momentum, which satisfies these, these three constraints. And P2 we shift in an opposite way. You see here that it manifestly satisfies momentum conservation. So the original momentum conservation here is also satisfied here because the shift cancels between these two. And uh, these constraints, uh, 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 these constraints give us that uh, this shifted momentum is still on shell because if we square it now, it would be still zero because there will be then p1 squared at zero, p1 dot q that is zero, and q squared at zero. We, we demand that this is true. So the shifted momenta here are still on shell, but Q is now some complex momentum. And we would proceed exactly in the same way, and we can also add masses uh, of particles. Uh, then P1 square wouldn't be zero, but M square. And the same thing for others. 
Okay, so uh, uh, this is for this two shift. This is called BCFW recursion relations, but there are extensions which shift more things, and uh, there are also extensions to certain effective field theories when there is some modification. The factorizations are not enough. We have to add some more information which tell us something about the underlying theory. And uh, yeah, so there are some extensions. The idea is more applicable than, than, than just what I showed. Okay, let me give you an example how to do these calculations. And I can look at the spin one particles because uh, these are the easiest examples. But before that, uh, let me mention something which is useful in general. So if I have a theory with color or flavor, uh, it's very useful to decompose the amplitude. So the amplitude uh, has some kinematical part and some group part. There are some color factors or flavor factors. Uh, now at tree level, we can always, uh, in Young Mills theory, in any other theories with flavors or colors, uh, we can decompose each Feynman diagram, if you now again think about the amplitude as the sum of Feynman diagrams, as the color part, like FABC, times the kinematical part. Where which has polarization vectors and it's gauge dependent and so on, but we can do it for each Feynman diagram. Now, uh, the color factors can be written in terms of traces of generators of that group. And uh, then we can just take the sum and then do it for the full amplitude. Now, if we choose uh, the basis of these color structures of these traces, then the full amplitude decomposes into the sum of following things. So there is some trace part, and uh, there is some function which multiplies that. So it separates, as the individual Feynman diagrams, it separates the color part and the kinematical part. But now, this is the full amplitude, so here everything is gauge invariant and uh, on shell. Uh, these functions are now ordered. So unlike the full amplitude, where uh, which has complete permutational symmetry in all particles. Uh, this doesn't have a permutational symmetry, but has cyclic symmetry. The reason is that the trace is ordered, because trace has a cyclic symmetry. Now, this function would also have a cyclic symmetry. And now here we sum over all permutations of these labels. So we take an ordering 1, 2, 3 to the n. We put also the, the corresponding uh, generators here for particles 1 to n and then we sum over all permutations. So this is how to write uh, uh, amplitudes of gluons in young mills or any other theories with colors or flavors in terms of these, uh, of these ordered amplitudes. So here particles are ordered. Other orderings are related by permutation. So if I have ordering 1, 3, 2, 4, up to n, you, you just flip labels 2 and 3 in that formula for this thing. And they are gauge invariant, and this is a kind of key object if, if we study uh, young mills amplitudes. And uh, normally, if we study that function, we consider all particles massless on shell, all momenta incoming, and all helicities fixed. So we again talk about some helicity amplitude here. This is not officially the complete amplitude because this is this ordering of particles. Yeah, it's a. Uh, it's one, it's a component of the amplitude for this ordering. If you want the complete amplitude, you first have to calculate that, multiply it by this trace, and sum over all permutations. That would be the full amplitude. Okay, but all the inform everything we need to is to calculate the amplitude for this one particular ordering. Yeah, then it's just a box. We put that one, multiply by trace, summing permutations, giving the complete answer. Okay. So now let's uh, do the example. So let's consider the four-point amplitude. And let's pick some helicities, like one plus, two minus, three minus, four plus. So four gluonic amplitude with this particular helicities. And let's see how these recursion relations work and what do we get in the end. Now, uh, here we consider we want this ordered amplitude to calculate. Uh, so. Uh, all the particles must be ordered. One, two, three, four. There is no one, three, two, four. 
and so on. All the particles are ordered. And uh, here we decided to shift legs one and two, momenta one and two, in the following way. So lambda one of this one is shifted like that. Lambda two tilde of this one is shifted like that. And there is actually only one diagram that can contribute, because one and two must be on the other sides. So this is the only thing if uh, this is the only thing that contributes. The other case would be that one and two is on one side and three and four is on the other side. But as we said, this is not the term that would contribute. One and two must be on the other sides. Okay, so uh, what, is, uh, what is that now? So uh, this is a three-point amplitude because uh, uh, in the formula, it was a product of left and right amplitudes and the pole. So the pole is 1 over S23. And this is a three-point amplitude with these helicities on one side. And this is a three-point amplitude with these helicities on the other side. Now, in principle, we would have to sum over two terms because the internal helicity is not fixed. It can be plus here and minus here, or minus here, plus here. It must be opposite on uh, both sides of uh, the like, question. Uh, but uh, the other one would have actually vanishing amplitude. It would be amplitude with plus, 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 and that's zero. Okay, so this is the only term that contributes. So this is a three-point amplitude with helicity, uh, with particles one hat, which is shifted, four and p. These two are plus, and this is minus, so we can just write a three-point amplitude for that. It's one hat four cube of the square bracket and one hat p, four p, and four p, all square brackets. And the other is, again, three-point amplitude. So we know what is the formula for that. Now, two hat minus, three minus, and p plus. This is the formula for that three-point amplitude. So this is the result. Now there are these hats, and there is this p, so we just have to rewrite it in terms of uh, 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 the original things. Okay. Now, how to rewrite it? First, uh, uh, we have to see what was the, how this z is localized. We know that the z is localized to zj, uh, what we call it zj before, when uh, this p is on shell, which means that uh, the sum of these two momenta is on shell, or these two momenta is on shell, that's the same thing. So the p square is equal to one hat four, angle bracket, one four square bracket. Yeah, only the, from the label one, only the lambda is shifted. So uh, uh, we are not moving with kinematics, so the only thing we are moving is z, but the z is only hidden here, not here. So if we rewrite it, lambda one, till, uh, lambda one hat was lambda one minus z lambda two. So we just plug it here and we get this relation. So the z uh, gets, localize at this value. Okay, so and then uh, there are some, uh, now we take this value of z, we plug here into these two formulas, and we, have, and we find lambda one hat and lambda two tilde hat, because we want to plug it here into these formulas, so we have to first find it. And, uh, okay, well, it's a little bit of work, not much, and we are getting some expressions in terms of these spinner helicity variables. So here I take this, I plug it there, I use these Schouten relations that I introduced before, I do the same thing with this tilde, lambda two tilde, I put the z here, and I use the, actually the momentum conservation here. But well, I recommend to do this uh, small exercise, but in the end we arrive at the expressions which look like that, and we can just plug it back. Okay. So this is the final relations for lambda one hat is equal to this uh, ratio of brackets times lambda four. And if we calculate uh, P, what was uh, the P momentum uh, that was given by lambda one hat, lambda one tilde plus lambda four, lambda four tilde, we again plug for that. And we will see that lambda P, because it's an on-shell momentum, it has its own lambda, was equal to lambda four, and lambda p tilde was equal to that expression. 
Yeah? So it's just uh, doing these calculations. We arrive at this expression. So now we have everything we need here on the right side. We have all these hats, and we have lambda p, lambda p tilde. So we have to just plug it here. Yeah, for that, 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 this, 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 this. If we plug it there, we get this expression. And uh, this is a formula. You can, you can notice that it looks like this part Taylor factor I showed before. And indeed, this is a formula for four point amplitude for gluonic amplitude with two minus, three minus, one plus, four plus with this cyclic ordering. So if you want to get the complete expression, we would take that, multiply by traces, and do the, the, the thing that I showed before. Now, uh, this one diagram uh, gives us, because we can actually do this, uh, as I said, we can do this decomposition in terms of color and kinematics also for individual Feynman diagrams. So if you do it, we would get some color ordered Feynman rules. And uh, for this ordering, there will be three Feynman diagrams that contribute. There would be a contact term, there would be one with uh, S channel and one with T channel. The U channel will be missing here because it exactly has the wrong ordering of particles. And uh, if we do it, there will be these three Feynman diagrams, but they would reproduce the same expression which is here, but here we got it just as a single term. So there is a single factorization diagram or a term in the recursion, uh, which is a gauge invariant function and it's equal to the sum of these three things, which are not gauge invariant. Okay, so that was kind of easy. It was just four point. Uh, now, uh, uh, we, let, me just, uh, uh, let me just review what, how would we would proceed uh, for something more complicated like six point amplitude. So the six-point amplitude, suppose that we fix the helicities like that and shift legs three and four, there will be three diagrams which, is, which are consistent with that ordering versus 220 Feynman diagrams we would have to draw. Uh, so it's very economic, it's only three, and that's for generic six-point amplitude. But for this particular helicity, actually, the middle one would not contribute, so it would be would be zero, so it would be only two in the end. Now, this formula looks a little bit funny. So this is once we evaluate. If we go through all the procedure, what I did before, but now that's not a product of two three-point amplitudes, but on one side, it's actually a five-point amplitude, which I already need as an input in the recursion. And on the other side, it's three-point. And then this is five-point on this side and three-point on this side, yeah? So it's very recursive. You need everything up to n minus one point in order to calculate n point, but then the n point calculation is easy, relatively. Now, uh, there is something interesting, because if I then evaluate, so that would take a while, it would take one lecture, maybe, to do this calculation completely, but know that there are 220 Feynman diagrams, which we will not do even in a year, uh, probably. Uh, uh, so if you evaluate uh, that, uh, you get expression in spinner helicity variables which looks like that. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting because some of the things here in the denominator are, uh, are kind of well understood. Uh, there is S234, that's a multi-particle factorization channel. Uh, note that this is not a channel in this diagram. Yeah, it just comes from all these shifts, it generates a pole, because in the end, the sum of these three diagrams and for this particular helicity, this one is even zero. So some of these two have to reproduce all poles that the amplitude has. It has many poles, but we have only two diagrams. In Feynman diagrams, you would have to go one by one. But here, one term actually reproduces many, many uh, different uh, factorizations. And it's all through these shifts, because uh, this looks like only having the S23 pole, but it actually has many more poles, because it gets shifted and evaluated and so on. But one thing which is interesting, so these are the ordinary poles, uh, 2, 3, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 6, 1. This comes from S2, 3, S3, 4, S5, 6, and X6, 1. Uh, because as we said, SIJ factorizes into square bracket IJ, angle bracket IJ. 
So this is always one of them, and this is directly the multiparticle pole S234. But this pole looks funny. It has this mixed bracket, and this never shows up in any Feynman propagator. So this is a spurious pole. Yeah? So this is a generic feature of these recursion relations that produce terms, which are, or expansion, which is extremely compact, but it has spurious poles. It has poles that the final amplitude doesn't have, but the individual terms do have. So this term has a pole, and this term has the same pole, and if you add them together, the pole cancels. Okay, so let me just remark on these recursion relations. So they are very efficient, so this is three terms versus 220. For Feynman diagrams at eight point, it's 20 terms versus 34,000, and then it continues to grow, and this is all just three level. Now, uh, the terms in these BCFW recursion relations are individual gauge invariant functions because they are products of on-shell amplitudes and these are gauge invariant, but they have spurious poles. So it's always somehow uh, you are gaining something, but you are losing something else. Of course, in terms of efficiency, you are gaining a lot. In terms of properties, you are gaining gauge invariants, but you are the artifact of that expansion are these spurious poles. Now, uh, the amplitude is a sum of these terms in the recursion, and that's directly dictated by unitarity. So it's dictated by this factorization, uh, which is just unitarity, as we shown before. And uh, in the general expansion, not all factorization channels are present. For example, when one and two, if we shift one and two, are on the same side, that, that factorization channel is not there. Okay, so these are... Uh, recursion relations for trees. And uh, uh, this is now the standard method how to calculate tree level amplitudes in uh, most of the quantum field theories because of its efficiency and there are computer codes that do it for you. It's very nice to do something by hand, at least four, five, six points, that's all doable. For higher points, because it's recursive, it's very easy to program it in Mathematica. And uh, you can get you can get 15 point amplitudes and so on very quickly, yeah, without so much problem. So uh, this is kind of the state of the art for the tree level amplitudes, what people normally use as a tool for calculating them. Now uh, let me talk about the other method, which now deals with loop amplitudes, not tree level. And this was actually developed earlier. So the these BCFW recursion relations were formulated only in 2005, or in the late 2004, early 2005. And uh, the main reason why it took so long was that uh, the main input in the recursion are three-point amplitudes. And uh, for a long time, three-point amplitudes were not taken seriously, exactly because of this problem that they vanish for real kinematics and you have to deal with complex momenta. So it, it took a long time to actually go uh, on that path and to figure out that complex momenta are very useful. Because once you have the final expression, despite you glue that from the three-point amplitudes, like in four points, uh, the fact that the intermediate legs are uh, complex don't matter because you can just then put the external legs to be real in the final answer but uh, the fact that in the intermediate steps you deal with complex momenta is very useful. Okay, so now let's go to these unitarity methods for loops. And uh, so what's the standard idea? So let's look at one loop amplitude. So now we are not dealing with tree level anymore, but we have one loop amplitude. And uh, again, if you think about it as sum of Feynman diagrams, the one loop amplitude is a sum over all Feynman diagrams, let's say, which I denote like integrals over dij, where dij is d4l times ij, where this is just some rational function. Yeah? So each Feynman diagram at one loop is just some uh, four-dimensional integral over some function ij. Now, again, nothing is gauge invariant and so on, but uh, in Feynman diagrams, there are certain topologies, integral topologies that show up, so what people figured out is that it's very useful not to think about it as sum of Feynman diagrams, but re-express the function on the left 
as a sum of some standard integrals that uh, would span the basis of all integrals at one loop. So any Feynman diagram can be decomposed using these integrals, which means that also the full amplitude can be decomposed using these integrals. And I will show it on the next slide uh, what these integrals are, but uh, at one loop there, is a, there are box integrals. They have four propagators. I denote it with four triangle integrals with three propagators, bubble integrals with two propagators, and then there are some rational functions which don't have any integration left. Yeah? And any one loop amplitude in any quantum field theory can be expressed in terms of these objects, where now these coefficients aj, bj, and cj, and these rational functions are, of course, theory dependent. So in each different theory and different amplitude, these coefficients will be different. But uh, this is just a useful basis of objects we can use to write any one loop amplitude. Now, what these integrals are, these integrals are just uh, standard integrals that you would, for example, get uh, just standard scalar integrals. So the box integral looks like that. It's just D4L. There is some normalization for four point, that's T. And then there is a product of four propagators which corresponds to these uh, internal lines. And L is the loop momentum. Uh, the same thing for triangle. There are only three propagators. And in bubble, there are only two propagators. Now, maybe you saw also the tadpole integrals, which have only one propagator. Uh, however, if we deal with uh, massless particles, these tadpole integrals actually vanish in dimensional regularization. So we normally don't consider them because they are irrelevant. But these are standard integrals. They are calculated. They are in appendices of many papers. They are in textbooks. So you just, you just evaluate them once. And then you can use them for any amplitude in any quantum field theory. Yeah, you just look there. And the only thing uh, which you have to calculate are these coefficients. Yeah, so these all things are known. Now, there is something special about this rational function. Uh, but let me discuss it in a second. Now. These two integrals are UV finite, but this integral just by power counting is UV divergent. There is D4L here and L square and L square. So when L goes to infinity, this is logarithmically divergent integral. So if you have UV divergent theories, this integral would naturally show up. In UV finite theories, it shouldn't. OK, so let me uh, say. Uh, how supersymmetry simplifies that expansion at one loop. So if I have a pure Young's theory, or massless QCD, or any other theory, any standard model, anything, uh, general theory, then I would need all terms. I would need these box integrals, triangle integrals, bubble integrals, and rational terms. Rational terms don't need any integration. Yeah. Uh, if I add some little bit of supersymmetry, at least n equals 1 or n equals 2 supersymmetry, there are no rational terms. Only these three terms would survive. And if I add maximal supersymmetry, n equals 4, maximal supersymmetry in four dimensions, these two would disappear, and only this first, these box integrals would be present at one loop. And uh, uh, so the supersymmetry helps a lot to simplify the result. And note that because only these guys were divergent, then amplitudes in this theory should be also should be UV finite at one loop. And actually, it's true to, to all loop orders here, not just one loop. But you can see it even in this expansion. Now, uh, so let's look at again at this expansion. And uh, uh, now the question is how to calculate these coefficients. Yeah. So I said that these integrals you just calculate once. You have it in the table. Mathematica knows what these integrals are. You don't have to calculate them again. Uh, but these coefficients, if you want to calculate some particular amplitude, you need to know these coefficients. And also you need to know this rational function. And the unitarity methods tell you how to calculate these coefficients. How to calculate this rational function is much, it's more complicated and there is not a general theory yet how to do it. It's normally done case by case basis. You have to go to certain limits and use some information to do it. So uh, the story about that one is not 
known yet in general, but the story about these coefficients is, not, is known completely. Okay, so what is the tool we are using? And it's an analog of the three-level unitarity now at one loop. Now, um, at three level, we set one, we set the internal leg to be on a shell, and then the amplitude factorized into two sub-amplitudes. The analog of that at one loop is so-called unitarity cut, when we take the one loop amplitude and we set two propagators to zero, now involving L, the loop momentum L. So L square and L plus Q square, where Q is the sum of external momenta on this side. And the analog is that this thing then factorizes into a product of two three-level amplitudes, this one and this one. These are now trees. This was one loop. And there is one over L square and L plus Q square. Two of the legs of these three-level amplitudes are now these on-shell internal legs. Now there are two of them. Uh, I will normally, well, it's unitarity cut, and I will normally say cut many, I will say cut many times. The cut means setting L square to zero, yeah, or L plus Q square, some propagator to zero. This is, uh, there is a close analogy between this and the optical theorem for those who heard about it. This is a uh, integrand level version. Okay, now, uh, we can actually continue, we can take this picture, and farther, these are now trees. Yeah? So we factorized one loop into two trees, but now we can take this tree, again take it as a blob, and go on the factorization channel, and again factorize it. Or take this blob, and again factorize it. So that would mean not setting two propagators to zero, but three propagators to zero. So L square, L plus Q1 square, and some L plus Q2 square is zero. Three propagators is zero. And then the full amplitude actually factorizes into the product of three three-level amplitudes, not just two. And we can do even more. We can set four of them to zero, like factorize that and that. And then the amplitude then factorizes into product of four three-level amplitudes. We cannot set more to zero because L has four degrees of freedom. It's an off-shell momentum in four dimensions, so we can at most impose four constraints. Yeah? Yes? So, yeah, so, so uh, yes. Uh, so that's uh, the process of integration. We are not integrating yet, so we are now working in four dimensions. There are some subtleties with that related and... Uh, No, so this is, uh, it's four degrees of freedom in four dimensions, yeah. So you, if you go to four plus epsilon, you need uh, a little bit more. So in principle, you have to do it in D dimensions. So I'm doing it in four dimensions. There is a way how to upgrade it from four to D. That's kind of a separate story. But at one loop, there is actually no subtlety. You will never need more than this type of information. Yeah, I, it's a very good question, yeah, because one has to be careful it would be better to do everything in four dimensions because, but things are divergent and we have to regulate them. So we have to be careful about working in four versus four plus epsilon. Okay, so that's how the amplitudes behaves on cuts. And this is called triple cut because we cut three propagators. This is called quadrupole cut because we cut four propagators. And now using these cuts, you see that uh, these pictures this is uh, what uh, just the unitarity gives us. It's just combination of this picture and this picture. We know that if we take the one loop amplitude and before integration, there is a loop momentum here. We are not integrating anything yet. Uh, and uh, we set these three propagators to zero. The thing must factorize into product of three three-level amplitudes. Here in this case, four three-level amplitudes. So we can just do it, we can just write this expansion and perform these cuts on both sides of the equation. On the left side, on the amplitude side, we get product of trees. Yeah? This is what these unitarity uh, relations give us. On the right side, we are singling out integrals with, which have these propagators. So for example, if we cut four propagators, we are going to quadruple cut. 
the bubble integral doesn't have four propagators. That one, this one doesn't contribute. Triangle integral doesn't have four propagators, only three, also doesn't contribute. Only box integral has four propagators. So only, actually only one box integral contributes. So from the quadrupole cut, we can write aj, this coefficient for some box, as a product of four three-level amplitudes which correspond to this quadrupole cut, to, to that picture I showed before. So this actually fixes all coefficients here. If we want to fix coefficients of triangles, we only can cut three propagators. Now, of course, then we get mixing from boxes because the box integrals have four, so there is a subset of three. Many box integrals have given three propagators in it. But uh, it's only the boxes uh, and one triangle integral. So we get some, co we get some linear equation for between aj and bj. And then if we can fix, want to fix also that, we get uh, some linear relations between aj, bj, and cj. So in the end, we generate a set of linear relations for aj, bj, and cj. These rational terms cannot be obtained from these, uh, from these cuts because they don't have any propagators. There is no loop momentum dependence. OK, now we can iterate. Uh, so this was at one loop. So this uh, system can be always solved. So we can always, in any theory, solve for these coefficients and either get an important part of the answer in general, modulo these terms, or a complete answer if these terms are missing. And as I said, there are some special limits and special treatments how we can get uh, these rational terms, but the, there is not a complete story of that yet. But for these coefficients, this is all with that, that we need. Now, of course, this can be also used at higher loops, not just one loop. And it's just iteration of these two procedures. So if we have a one, two loop amplitude and we go a unitarity cut, it factorizes into a product of one loop and three, or three and one loop. Yeah, and the cut, this cut always reduces the loop order by one. But we can also then factorize farther. This one, if it is one loop, we can do it once again and factorize it as a product of two trees. So in the end, we land on the pictures like this. If we factorize everything we can using either this relation or this relation, that's called maximal cut, when uh, the only thing which is left are just three-level amplitudes, or in the extreme case, only three-point amplitudes like that. We know that there are two different solutions for them, so I don't specify it. but. Uh, then the result of the cut, the residue on that cut, is the product of three-point on-shell amplitudes. We will discuss it more just in a second in terms of on-shell diagrams. OK, so uh, the general story to L-loops, of course, we cannot do L-loop calculation at the moment, but at least to certain loop order which is accessible, which is typically two, in certain cases more, especially supersymmetric, maximally supersymmetric theories where people can go higher, uh, is that we write the L-loop amplitude as a linear combination of some integrals with unknown coefficients. We use cuts uh, to, ge uh, to get the product of trees on the left-hand side, and this gives us the relations between the coefficients, because the cut give, gives trees here, then it gives some function because uh, of uh, it get, uh, these uh, cuts in the integrals get uh, uh, the, the, the propagators in integrals gets cuts cut, but we know what is the basis of integrals. So in the end, we just get the re linear relations between these things with certain qu certain factors which come from uh, cutting the propagators in these integrals. And uh, this is very successful method and. Uh, the loop, uh, the loop calculations using Feynman diagrams are even far worse than what I showed for the tree level because the combinatorics is extremely explosive. And in the end, it's the same integrals we have to calculate here. So we kind of do that very smart reshuffling because uh, instead of taking individual diagrams and decompose it in terms of uh, these integrals uh, in the basis, we already take the basis and just calculate these coefficients. So we completely ignore where they come from 
from uh, individual Feynman diagrams. Now, uh, this is, there is a two-step process how to use this thing. Is first find the basis of integrals and evaluate them. That we cannot, at the moment, there is no way how to bypass that part. Uh, and uh, the other is to solve the system of equations for the coefficients. So it's a two-step process. And once we solve it, then this is the, that's the final answer. And uh, uh, these methods were used in uh, kind of both uh, more theoretical investigations of theories. Uh, for example, in n equals eight supergravity, n equals four super young mills, uh, to know, to kind of probe some analytic structures of the theories, and for the case of gravity, to answer some questions about the UV uh, properties. Uh, so this actually went up to very high loop order at the moment. There is a five loop calculation for the four gluon and graviton scattering calculated uh, using these methods. But at the same time, it was actually used to calculate a QCD background for LHC. So this is mainly one loop and partially a two loop because they, these problems are much more difficult than in the maximally supersymmetric case. But uh, there is a black hat collaboration which uses these methods and uh, provides uh, the, uh, the, the, back, uh, the QCD background for, for the LHC which is used in the, in the code. Okay, uh, now, uh, so let me now compare the, these different methods and uh, how do we stand in uh, this off-shell, on-shell business. So we know that the Feynman diagrams are completely off-shell objects. Now these unitarity methods are not completely on-shell. Uh, if we do these cuts on the amplitude, the cut is given by the product of amplitudes, which is on-shell, but these basis of integrals these are just off-shell objects. There is a loop momentum which is off-shell. Uh, it must be because the loop momentum is an off-shell momentum. It's not on-shell. So the integrals are, integral, the coefficients are nice. These are products of trees once we solve it, but the integrals are not, are not on-shell. Uh, they have off-shell loop momentum. Uh, unlike at tree level, the recursion relations directly work with on-shell objects. Uh, but uh, the price we had to pay was to introduce these spurious poles term by term in these relations. So the locality, the fact that the only poles were p square, uh, was lost manifestly, but the on-shellness uh, was preserved at every step. Okay. So now let's talk more about uh, these cut diagrams. And uh, kind of we go now back, we, we ask what are the natural gauge invariant objects? And uh, again, as we know, these are scattering amplitudes. And uh, in the recursion relations and also partially in the unitarity methods for these coefficients, uh, these uh, we, deal, we dealt with products of amplitudes. If we do this procedure iteratively, using recursion relations, we reduce everything to elementary amplitudes, which are three-point. So now let's uh, go back to the three-point amplitudes and let's see what we can do with them directly. So this is just a reminder. So <clears throat> the three-point amplitudes, uh, we had this three-point kinematics discussion. There is either this option or this option. Or again, I just reviewed these are the spinner helicity variables. These are two solutions for three point kinematics. Either our lambdas are proportional or lambda tildes are proportional. So let me now uh, stick with uh, uh, these figures. So this denotes that case and that denotes that case whenever uh, you see <coughs> this picture again. Uh, this was for kinematics. For amplitudes, we had for arbitrary helicities H1, H2, and H3, uh, we found this formula, if the sum of helicities was bigger or equal to zero, or this formula, when the sum of helicities was smaller or equal to zero. Now, uh, if we, so this is for any amplitudes. Now, if we have a supersymmetry, we have the super 
fields rather than the fields on the external states, though, so they can involve many different helicities together, n equals one supersymmetry uh, involves some helicities, n equals two, and it's very convenient to work with n equals the maximal supersymmetry, which involves uh, particles of all helicities. So for me at the moment, it's just the easy bookkeeping. I will explain why is it easy bookkeeping. It's not essential in this part of the discussion because as we know, these three-point amplitudes are fully fixed in any quantum field theory. We don't need any supersymmetry. Uh, the reason why it's simple to here work with the maximal supersymmetry is that uh, I want to work with these figures and if I have fixed helicities, I would have to specify what is the helicity on, on particle one, two, and three, and kind of keep track of that once I do gluing of these things together, which I will do uh, in a moment. If I have maximal supersymmetry, uh, there is no need to specify anything about uh, these, uh, these external legs because they contain uh, uh, the maximum, the max, uh, the, the Superfield for the uh, maximal supersymmetry contains uh, all the states for, in, in this case, for the super young males from the positive helicity gluon, fermion, scalar, uh, antifermion to the negative helicity gluon. So it contains all the spectrum of these fields, and uh, there is no need to specify what uh, what the what the helicities of these things are. Yeah, this is just a technical point. Yeah, I will not use the properties of this theory uh, uh, here much. So uh, if we use uh, this maximal supersymmetry, super the uh, expressions that we had before for the gluonic amplitudes get a little bit changed. I now write the momentum conservation as a delta function that I can do for anything. And then there is also some super momentum conservation. So these are some fermionic variables in the expansion of superfield. Um, I will talk a little bit more about it in the next lecture when talk about this theory more specifically. And there is a similar thing for the other one. Now the thing is that what I want to do, and I want to do it in general theory, not just in this case. In this case, it's just much simpler to show it, is to draw pictures like that. We already had pictures like that before. I take two different three-point amplitudes and I glue them together. Now, what does the gluing mean? It just means that I take the product of these two amplitudes of legs one, four, and P, and P, two, and three. And uh, particle P is on shell. So this is the product of two on-shell amplitudes. We already saw that picture, and that picture was a factorization channel of the four-point amplitude when I went on the, on the T channel when P2 plus P3 squared was equal to zero. But now I look at it from the other point of view, from the point of view of gluing two three-point amplitudes together. Uh, and uh, I can just... Uh, uh, I can just take this expression. So there are these two blobs, white and blue. Uh, there, is, uh, there is some counting, some k counting. Uh, as, I, as we discussed before, this corresponds to having two plus and one minus helicity. This is two minus and one plus helicity. So there is some way how to, uh, how to boost it to the supersymmetry to count something called R charge. Uh, but, uh, uh, we can think about it as helicities so, uh, as well. So in order to get a consistent amplitude, I need two, these two blobs of different color. I can also calculate the same diagram with two same colors, two blue or two white. The answer would be zero. So this is the only non-zero uh, object I can calculate. So, so, what, uh, so what is the result? So if I take these two things, now I can, don't have to do it using supersymmetry, but then I will have to keep track of the helicities here in the pictures. Uh, but, but I can do it using supersymmetry here. But in the end, in any cases, in all cases, I get a four-point amplitude, one, two, three, four, an extra delta function, which tells me that P2 plus P3 squared is zero. This is exactly four-point three-level amplitude on this factorization channel. I think about the delta function just as a constraint on external kinematics. Or it's a four-point amplitude with that constraint. We're saying that T is equal to zero. 
So this is, a, this is the opposite way to how to get this thing. Before, we thought about it as cutting this middle leg, but now I think about it as gluing these two things together, taking the product of these three point amplitudes. If I think about it from that point of view, I can then glue other things together, not just two, but for example, four. And I can build a picture like that. When I have uh, internal momenta P1, P2, P3, and P4, which are all on shell, and I can multiply these four uh, Three, uh, these four three-point amplitudes together. So you see that there are three points with particle one, P1, P2, P4, two, P2, P1, three, P3, P2, and four, P4, P3, and this one and two just denote if it is blue vertex or white vertex. This counts this number of negative helicytic gluons. Okay. And if I do that, uh, I get a four-point amplitude. Yeah, I get exactly the same expression we got before for the four-point amplitude. So the first thing wasn't much surprise what we got here. This is what we expect. This is kind of surprise. Why the product of four three-point amplitudes should give me four-point amplitude? That naively doesn't make much sense. But uh, it is correct. and. Uh, that's the result for this diagram. And uh, in general, I will, we will explain just uh, uh, in a minute why this is true. But I can just continue this game, and I can start to draw more and more complicated diagrams. And the only ru the rule how to calculate the diagram is just to take the product of three-point amplitudes in the corners when all the legs here are on shell. Yeah? So that maybe was the naive surprise because this looks like one loop diagram if it was a Feynman diagram, but it's not. Because in Feynman diagram, these internal lines would be off shell and we would integrate over that loop momentum. Here, everything is on shell. Yeah? If you want to think about it as a one loop diagram, you have to impose four different constraints. You have to say that these four propagators are on shell. This puts four constraints on the loop momentum that has four degrees of freedom, and that specifies the loop momentum completely. There is no degree of freedom left. This is the interpretation, if you look at it from the other point of view. This is the quadruple cut of one loop four point amplitude. So in a sense, is it one loop four point amplitude, but with four extra constraints, which cuts four propagators. The same thing is that, from one point of view, we can think about it as a product of these three level amplitudes in the corners you see, with everything on shell. The other point of view is that it's actually a two loop five point diagram with eight constraints. It's um, that these eight propagators are all on shell. Okay, and this is the interpretation for all these diagrams, yeah? but uh, I can just glue them together and get them more and more complicated diagrams. And it's not clear what they are good for, but these are on-shell gauge invariant objects. Yeah? They are just product of three-point amplitudes, which are on-shell and gauge invariant. Therefore, I, in the end, get gauge invariant objects There is uh, with only on-shell information in it. Okay, so there is some... Uh, uh, I don't have much time. There is some counting of how to count if uh, the function that we get is actually a rational function, uh, like the four-point three-level amplitude, which is that diagram. Or in this diagram, we had some extra constraint on external kinematics. So there is some easy counting to see if you count number of propagators and number of loops in the diagrams. And uh, there is also the way how to associate this label K, the number of negative helicity gluons, if you want. Uh, but it's something which is intrinsic for the diagram. The N is the number of external legs that you can easily read off, but this label K, you can associate with the number of bl blue vertices, white vertices, minus uh, the number of propagators using that formula. Now, so these are interesting objects, and we can calculate them, and it doesn't have to be in Young-Nels or Super-Young-Nels. 
yeah, depends on what these three point amplitudes are. We can do it for in QED or anything else. Yeah, we can just construct these objects. That's perfectly fine. Uh, and we know how to do it because the three point amplitude exists in all these theories. Therefore, these objects, as products of three point amplitudes, also exist. Well, the question is is it actually interesting? Can we build uh, the thing that we would like to do is build amplitudes from these objects? Yeah. At the moment, they were just interesting gauge invariant objects, but not necessarily useful for something. But the, the, the useful thing would be if they actually building blocks for amplitudes. And there is some hope. We already saw that this single object was a four-point amplitude of gluons in young males or super young males. Uh, so what about the others? Or is there any way how to do it? And there is actually a way how to do it, and it's somehow trivial in a sense that uh, these objects are natural, uh, natural building blocks in these recursion relations. And, well, let me quickly explain it. So let's consider the following diagram. Uh, this is some blob, so this is some very complicated structure, many blue and white vertices, a lot of things in it. And on top of that, we add this extra thing. Yeah, we call it BCMW bridge. Now, you can ask if we have uh, the, if the blob is some function, k0, adding this thing would uh, actually add one more parameter, which is the momentum flowing here, and the new function would be k1, which depends now on z, would be dz over z times the old function sitting here, k0, and which will also now depend on z. And this is exactly which is in the recursion relations. Yeah, we have k0, which was the original amplitude. Now we shifted that. Yeah, we shifted two of the momenta. This is what this picture does. Shifts momentum n and 1 in this way. This is the BCFW shift, and we get the shifted amplitude. So now we can just proceed exactly as we did in the recursion relations. Algebraically, we proceed that. Here we can just proceed diagrammatically, and it's in one-to-one -one correspondence. So we have uh, this diagram that represents some shifted, if this is an amplitude, suppose that this was an amplitude, then we get a shifted amplitude A and Z. And now we use the Cauchy's formula on Z. Now the Cauchy's formula has a very nice diagrammatic interpretation here, is that uh, the Cauchy's formula says that the sum over all residues is zero, I, let me denote it just as uh, the sum over all uh, well, delta A and Z is zero. And each residue in Z, because now these functions depend on Z, means erasing one edge in the diagram. So I take this diagram and then I sum over all diagrams coming from this one when I erase one edge in the diagram, which would depend on Z. And uh, this is what we get as a result. We can, for ex we can erase this edge that will give us the original amplitude, but then we can also erase an edge inside the blob, and that would factorize the thing into two. Okay, so there are a few more things about it, but uh, this means that the three-level amplitude is a sum of on-shell diagrams, and the term by term, it's identically to these BCFW recursion relations. But let me see it on the example, rather than saying it more theoretically, what uh, the representation is. And uh, uh, the procedure is that I take two amplitudes, left and right, and I add this bridge. So this is now that we can easily see how we can arrive for four point on this expression. I take this factorization channel, that's my input, three point, three point, and I add a bridge on 3, 4, which is adding this extra structure on 3, 4, and that gives us this diagram. So therefore, and this is a complete answer for four-point amplitude. For five-point amplitude, uh, for certain number, for k equals two, the number of negative helicity gluons is two, I start with three-point here, four-point here, so it's a factorization into three and four, and I add this bridge on one and five in this case. And I get this diagram in the end. And that's a full five-point amplitude in that case. 
Huh? But here we can directly see it that there is a four point hiding here and three point hiding here, and on top of that is the bridge. And this bridge, which is very easy diagrammatic thing, does all these things about shifting with Z, evaluating it at Paul. It's all done automatically, yeah, here. So uh, if I do six point amplitude, uh, we get three diagrams. This is for, well, I'm kind of omitting details, but this is for K equals three, when there are three negative and three positive helicity gluons. And uh, the recursion gives me three terms, which I showed before, and these are just three on-shell diagrams. And you can see that there is a five-point amplitude sitting here that we already constructed in the previous step, and three-point here. There is a four-point here and four-point here, and there is a three-point here and five-point here. So these are all allowed factorization channels. And uh, on top of that, we are adding this bridge six one, six one, six one. It must be always the same one. So the amplitude is a sum of three on-shell diagrams in that case. And there is some extension to, so this was for tree level. Uh, that works for young males. Uh, you can make sense of that in other theories, but it's now a little more complicated because uh, the BCFW recursion relations, if it works, you can do it directly. If you do other recursion relations, as I said, in the standard model, you need other ones, then you need to embed these recursion relations in this formalism, which is not done in general, not done in general yet. Uh, it works for certain, yeah, it works uh, for, for large class of theories and just that. But I'm showing that here for young males. The BCFW, uh, well, the recursion relation idea works in general, but this on-shell diagrammatic embedding uh, has a little bit more limited use. Okay, but uh, this is all for tree level. What about loops? Well, that would be very ambitious. There is only one case where we know how to do it for loops, and that's... Uh, I will talk a little bit more also next time. It's the case of this maximally supersymmetric Young-Mills theory, which is very nice for many point of views. And in that case, you can actually write the L-loop integrand before you integrate it in terms of on-shell diagrams. And there is some extension, so this is the picture we have before for the trees. Now L left and right are actually loop amplitudes, not just tree level amplitudes. And then there is some one more term uh, called forward limit term, which is very interesting because you can naively ask how do we, everything is on shell, how do we get an off shell loop momentum in, term, in these diagrams? Everything is on shell. And uh, it's starting with some on shell momentum, uh, which has three degrees of freedom, and uh, this bridge adds one more degrees of freedom, and that gives us in the end four degrees of freedom. And so we mimic off-shell using on-shell plus one more degree of freedom. So this is the way how to do it. And then, for example, just uh, the final thing, let me uh, show. So instead of one loop, if we, work about one, uh, if we talk about one loop, the one loop four-point amplitude, which in this theory, as I said, there are no triangles or bubbles. There is only box integral. So the full one loop four-point amplitude is given by this scalar box integral but it has off-shell loop momentum. We don't have anything off-shell. Uh, this is algebraically equal to this kind of monster diagram, which is five-loop on-shell diagram, uh, and it's given by gluing together three-point amplitudes. And uh, you can show that it has four degrees of freedom left once you do it, and you can identify them with the loop momenta. And, uh, so oh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's this diagram. Okay, well, don't show diagrams are, uh, as I said, you can calculate them in any quantum field theory, planar, non-planar, you can write things like that. You can have many particle species. Uh, you don't need to have only single one. They are gauge invariant on-shell objects given by product of amplitudes. But the open question is how, in general, you can reconstruct even tree-level amplitudes from them. So they are good building blocks because they are gauge invariant, but how to implement the recursion relations. And I showed, uh, showed that only for this case. At tree level, it's partially understood, not fully. At loops, it's not understood at all how to do it in general. Okay, that's all, thank you.